Okay, so every month we uh, highlight an activity related to the webinar topic. This month we are looking at our very own star, the sun. Vivian White has this month's activity, which is also found in the Night Sky Network, Our Magnetic Sun Outreach Toolkit. Vivian. Hi, everybody. So this month we're featuring the Our Magnetic Sun cards. These are cards that answer common questions that you get at the telescope. Uh, one of the most obvious is, isn't that dangerous? Um, to which we just give them some solar viewers and talk about the different ways that are safe to view the sun. Um, it also covers what you might see in an H-alpha scope versus a um, optical uh, filtered telescope um, and talks about the different features that you can find there. These are great to hand out while they're waiting in line to see in the telescope or um, you can even hang them up and people can just peruse them. Of course, what are those dark spots? Big questions. How long do they last? Why don't we always see them? May they please come back soon? I haven't seen any in a while. Um, and then also one of my favorites, how is the inside of the sun like a boiling pot of spaghetti? And what you do is you get one of your um, visitors to hold their arm out like this. And then you talk about how magnetic field comes through the photosphere of the sun and the places where it hits the, what we think of as the surface of the sun, right there is where you're gonna see those sunspots. So what you're seeing when there's a sunspot is actually just kind of like when spaghetti pops through the top of a pot of boiling water. So it has more information about the parts of the sun and what's going on in each and the convection that's happening inside. These are great resources. You can download them online. Um, looks like Brian's put the link and we'll put the link in the YouTube video as well. So enjoy. All right, well, thank you, Vivian. And now for our featured presentation. Dr. Nicola Fox is the project scientist for NASA's Parker Solar Probe mission. Nikki joined the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in 1998 as a research scientist where she studied various aspects of the geospace impact of coronal mass ejection events from the sun. Since 2015, she has served as the chief scientist for heliophysics in the space research branch. Prior to joining APL, Nikki was a USA National Research Council fellow at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and a research scientist at Raytheon with special responsibilities for the operations of the NASA Polar Spare Scout in the International Solar Terrestrial Physics Program. She earned her PhD in physics from the Imperial College of Science, a master's of science degree in telematics. And I'm not quite sure what telematics is. You might have to tell us what that is. From the University of Surrey and a bachelor's degree in physics from the Imperial College of Science. Please welcome Nikki Fox. Thank you. I'm just hoping I'm, I'm yes, I'm not muted, good. Um, okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I guess I'm talking about something that you don't normally talk about um, since you're the night sky and we're talking about something that we see during the day sky. Um, but as you noted, it is our, um, our very own star, the sun. And uh, I'm gonna talk about a mission um, that we're gonna send to into the sun's atmosphere to be able to answer some of the mysteries that have been around um, and plagued scientists for decades and decades. So of course it's Parker Solar Probe. Um, I have the honor of being the project scientist for this mission and I lovingly call it the uh, coolest, hottest mission under the sun. And so I'll start with some very simple science. Of course, we all know the sun is a very dynamic star and that we live in the atmosphere of the sun. We know that the hazy atmosphere, the corona that um, you see during an eclipse is continually streaming away and it bathes all of the planets. And so uh, when, when, when the sun does something interesting, we feel that impact here at earth. And so if we look at the current where we are in the current solar cycle. Um, so we're coming down from a pretty wimpy solar cycle, number 24, um, and uh, we're getting ready to launch the mission. So we'll come and sort of sweep through solar minimum. Then it's a seven year mission. So we'll be able to see the full swing um, up to solar maximum and be able to see lots of different types of solar activity. Um, Taking you back to 1859, that's the first time that we really realized that the sun had a profound impact on the earth. And so there was an amateur astronomer, British astronomer, James Carrington, who was staring through his brass telescope, sketching sunspots. And uh, while he was looking, he noticed this particularly large group had two bright flashes of light. He described them like white fireballs. Um, and he rushed off to get a colleague 
to uh, to show them what he'd seen. But by the time he got back, um, the, uh, the the fireballs had disappeared. But just a few hours later, um, the compass needles at Earth began to spin and uh, the aurora was seen down towards the equator, which was very unusual. And finally, the telegraph system in the US um, sparks shot from the telegraph uh, wires and the whole system went down for about four days which doesn't sound too serious to us now but if you tell your kids we'd have no internet for four days uh, i think you'd see some national panic starting pretty quickly um so this is just a, a look at nice figure that shows many of the impacts of space weather um, of course, we all you know, are familiar with power grid disturbances, um, but also any kind of long cables, um, cables that go under the sea, pipelines in Alaska. Um, it also has big effects on spacecraft. It can cause solar cell damage. Um, it can cause uh, problems with upsets in, in the uh, satellite electronics itself. Um, it can also cause issues with the, just the attitude control system. It can um, make satellites change their orbit. And it can also, if you get a lot of radiation coming in over the poles, it can cause us to have to either ground planes or at least reroute them so they don't fly over the poles. So what can we see here from Earth when we look at the sun? It's a fairly uniform sphere. Um, it's, the temperature is about 6,000 degrees centigrade. There are a couple of dark splotches you can see here, um, or sunspots, and that appears to be about it when we look at our star. And that would be very similar to an image that James Carrington was looking at when he was sketching his sunspots. But if we look close up at the sun, we find that it really is much more interesting. And those dark splotches, those sunspots, um, are really very active regions. Um, so just like Vivian mentioned about the spaghetti boiling up in the pot, you see these sort of loops of magnetic field, these loops of spaghetti, if you like, sticking up above the surface of the sun. And those are the loops that um, eventually can become uh, very stretched, uh, put a lot of energy into them and they'll actually kind of explode and uh, send all of that coronal material out into the atmosphere. Uh, so the only time that we, up, up until recently, that we could see the corona, of course, was during a total eclipse. And here's a nice picture, again, dating back to 1572, of astronomers taking advantage of this solar eclipse um, when the moon was covered Oh, sorry, the moon was covering the disk of the sun and uh, they were able to look at this atmosphere. And so um, many of us, of course, were lucky enough to see an eclipse recently. And you'll know that, you know, as you let your eye kind of become adapted to the dark, you can see this absolutely amazing corona um, encircling the sun. So here's just a couple of shots from um, the eclipse across America. Uh, I'm sure most of you took advantage of seeing it. Uh, I went out to Nebraska, um, sat in a field with about 12,000 people and it rained. Um, and so uh, we had to wait for the, we thought we weren't gonna see anything at all. And then just about as totality was occurring, the sun popped out or rather the clouds cleared and we could see um, the, the darkened disk of the sun and this amazing corona um, sort of being encircled by this huge storm cloud. So it's quite an amazing sight. Uh, so the sun is, uh, the corona itself is very unstable. It uh, produces a lot of solar flares, a lot of solar activity. Um, it's where the coronal mass ejections happen. But of course it's also the birthplace of the solar wind. And so it isn't just these large eruptions we see, but we know that the, the outer atmosphere is continually streaming away at speeds of about a million miles an hour. So the corona uh, is home to a couple of mysteries. Uh, this is the first one. So I'm showing you views of the sun in many different wavelengths, and they kind of correspond to distances away from the sun. So if we start at the sun's surface, and then we step away a little bit, you'll see it increases to 60,000 degrees. Now we're stepping away and it's up at a million. We keep stepping away until um, our last image here is a three million degree corona. And so that kind of defies the laws of nature or the laws of physics. Um, you're moving away from a heat source. The sun is a very large glowing body and yet we're getting hotter, not colder. 
And so our first mystery is why does the temperature rise? Why do we have this inversion as you move away from the surface of the sun? The second is really what is powering this, this phenomena? So if we, this is a, a nice artificial eclipse um, from the SOHO spacecraft. Uh, so we've got an occulting disk covering the, the surface of the sun, and then you can see the corona all around there. And what the one thing you'll see is that it is continually moving. It's very gusty. It's continually expanding away from the sun, and uh, that is the solar wind. So we don't really understand what causes this huge acceleration. So in this region where we see these incredible temperatures, suddenly all this plasma gets incredibly energized, so much so that it breaks away from the pull of the sun. It also carries with it the sun's magnetic field, which is very important for us here at Earth because we have a magnetic field and they can interact together and allow all of this energy from the, from the sun to actually come into our atmosphere and cause space weather. So if you imagine you actually um, put some energy in, in this region, and then you just let the solar wind flow, the solar wind would slow down much quicker than we actually see it when, you know, when it gets to the earth, it's moving much faster than we would predict. And so our second mystery is how is the solar wind continually accelerated? Why doesn't it just drop off um, if we let normal processes uh, take, take place. And so they are our two big mysteries. And so uh, we need to send a mission. So in 1958, James Van Allen and John Simpson co-chaired um, a committee. It was called the Simpson Committee. And they were asked to come up with um, guidance and advice for the newly forming agencies. So NASA, the NSF, and the DOD. Also in 1958, not only did James Van Allen launch Explorer 1, but a young scientist, Dr. Eugene Parker, published a paper. And in this paper, he postulated that this atmosphere, the corona, would indeed be expanding and move away from the sun in this sort of continuous fashion. He did it by taking four, um, as he puts it, very basic laws the laws of momentum, the law of conservation of energy, the ideal gas equation. And he basically put them together and solved them and came up with um, several different solutions um, and looked at which ones could actually be physically possible. And the solution he came up with was this continually expanding corona moving out, bathing all of the planets. Now, it was, a, it was a fairly controversial paper. In fact, one of his referees actually said, you know, if you're going to publish a paper in this kind of topic, you probably should go to the library first. Um, the, fortunately for Gene, the editor decided that, wow, if it's causing this much um, controversy, let's publish it and see what happens. And so in 1958, he published this paper. Uh, just a few years later, in 1962, uh, his theory was proved to be correct using Mariner um, observations where they did in fact see these continual flow of particles. Gene first of all called it corpuscular radiation. Um, he didn't call it the solar wind in his first paper, uh, but, but subsequently did. Um, he wasn't the first person to really realize this was happening. He was just the first person to, to give it a, to really understand it and make the prediction. Um, he'd spoken a lot with a German scientist called Biermann, who had actually discovered that the uh, comet tails always point away from the sun, regardless of which way they're moving. He didn't take it the extra step to say, obviously, something must be flowing from the sun to, to, to make that happen. So Gene worked together with him and, and they came up with this, this um, paper. And it was so, you know, sort of stunning and groundbreaking that it actually led the Simpson Committee to make one of the missions that they um, recommended to these agencies to be a probe to go into the sun's corona, so a solar probe. So of those 14 missions um, that were in the original Simpson Committee, the only one that has not yet flown is a solar probe. And that is purely because we've never had the technology to enable us to do it. So we are named for Gene Parker, uh, because of, obviously he wrote this amazing paper. Um, it's a, it was very historic. We renamed the mission last year. Um, and it's actually the first time that NASA has ever named a mission after somebody during their own lifetime. 
Uh, so it was wonderful for Gene to know that this mission um, was named after him. Um, and uh, you can see, so this was some photographs taken in October of last year when Gene visited us at the Applied Physics Lab and I was able to say the cheesy line to him, Parker, meet Parker. And uh, we took him in to see the spacecraft and uh, he had a wonderful time. So why haven't we gone to the sun yet? And it really is because we've been waiting until now for the technology to be available to us to make this kind of daring voyage. And it's the same kind of leap in technology that it would take for us to go from a rotary phone to a smartphone. And so if you think in 1958, if you wanted to talk to somebody or communicate with somebody, the only option you had was to use this very antiquated looking object here um, that is a rotary dial phone that would have been attached to, uh, to a wall in your house. Um, and that's the only way you could communicate with people. Now we all use our smartphones and I bet you probably use it for everything other than making a phone call. Uh, for me, if it comes down to me actually having to make a phone call, that's a really last, you know, last possible ditch attempt to get in contact with somebody. Um, but if you just think of the sheer technology that you hold in the palm of your hand with that smartphone, and compare that to just the amount of, of city blocks of buildings that it would take to house the computing power that could do what, what that smartphone does today. And that is the leap in technology that we've really needed to enable a solar probe. So the science of Parker Solar Probe. So I've already sort of generally talked about these two mysteries. Uh, why is the corona so much hotter than the sun? Why is that? Um, coronal material continually accelerated such that it bathes all of the planets. But the way we're going to do that, um, we obviously carry the, the instruments that are going to make these measurements, but um, we, we know that the sun's magnetic field is really the key to everything. Um, we know that it's very dynamic um, and that it is capable of, of transferring a lot of energy. And so we'll be studying um, the dynamics, the structure and the dynamics of the magnetic field, but also all the plasma that is trapped on those magnetic field lines, and we'll trace the flow of energy through the whole system. So basically we'll be looking at how the energy flows from the sun out into the corona and then out into the solar wind. And the last thing will uh, we'll be sort of last main goal is that we will look at those energetic particles that kind of skip across the top of the solar wind, if you like. Um, they're associated with the transients that we see, like the coronal mass ejections, the flares, shocks that we see in the solar wind. They all accelerate these very high energy particles. And so we'll be studying um, each of these things to be able to enable us to answer those key questions and key mysteries of just what the heck is going on in this coronal region. Uh, so how are we going to do it? We are going to send a probe to the sun, uh, Parker Solar Probe. Um, our launch window opens July 31st of this year. Uh, so it is about, I think, 77 days away. Uh, we have a 20 day launch window. Um, and we'll launch from Kennedy Space Center on a Delta IV Heavy with a custom made upper stage uh, for solar probe. Uh, if I, so now we're gonna look at the mission timeline. There's a nice shot of a Delta IV Heavy. It's a nighttime launch. We launch at 4.14 in the morning. So it will look very, very similar to this. So the Delta IV will clear the pad at uh, Kennedy Space Center. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, we'll, uh, the fairing will open and Solar Probe will taste space for the first time. Uh, we have a second stage cryogenically fueled um, stage here and you'll see that separating. And then you see our upper stage firing, giving us that final kick that we need to be able to lose all of the momentum of the earth and travel in towards the sun. So then we'll lift off from that third stage. The first thing we do is to pop out the solar panels to give us some power. And then we'll start to deploy the instruments. So there's the magnetometer boom that houses our magnetic field instruments coming out the back and the electric field antennas coming out um, around. Our, you saw that heat shield there um, that uh, is protecting the spacecraft. It's a very busy first six weeks for us because just six weeks after launch, we encounter the planet Venus for the first time. We use Venus to give us a gravity assist 
Um, we, uh, we actually use it to trim our orbit uh, so that we turn even closer and focus our orbit in towards the sun's corona. Um, just another six weeks after launch, we will uh, make our first closest approach. You'll see our solar panels tucking in. Um, that is to protect them, to stop them getting overheating as we get close to the sun. Uh, we'll make 24 orbits over the course of the seven years, and we will do seven Venus flybys. So we'll sort of gradually walk closer and closer in towards the sun um, until we're within uh, just 4 million miles of the sun's surface. So this is just a nice little cartoon showing you um, the, uh, the Venus flyby. We're very generous. We're unlike other missions that you've heard of that um, speed up as they fly past a planet. We actually give energy to Venus. So um, we are doing a sort of reverse uh, gravity assist, if you like. Um, as we fly by, we actually give energy, we donate energy to Venus, and then that allows us just to slow down and to trim our orbit. It's kind of like doing a bit like a handbrake turn um, so that we are focusing in, and as you'll see as we come out again, the orbit is smaller after doing that first Venus flyby. So seven of those um, allows us to get nice and close to the sun. So we're not competitive at all, we're just faster, hotter than closer than anything else has ever been. Um, so faster, we're traveling at about 430,000 miles an hour, or about 118 miles a second at closest approach. Hotter, of course, we're in that region of 3 million degree plasma. Um, we are protected by our heat shield, which faces brutal temperatures um, as we come in close. And, uh, and we are closer. So I mentioned as we are at our closest approach, we're at just under 4 million miles above the sun's surface. And several people say to me, 4 million miles, that doesn't sound very close. Um, but if I put the earth and the sun on either end of a football field, I'll drop in some planets just to kind of orient you. So there's Mercury on the sun's 35 yard line, Venus on Earth's 28 yard line. Some of these coronal loops uh, that we talked about, they can extend out to about the 15 yard line. So they're you know, really sticking out there. The current record holder is Helios 2, which was a US German mission that flew in, in the 80s. And that got as far as the sun's 29 yard line, so inside the orbit of Mercury. But now if we introduce to the stadium, Parker Solar Probe, uh, she will tuck and run all the way into the red zone, knocking on the door for a touchdown at the sun's four yard line. And so when you look at it in, in that perspective, uh, we really are incredibly, incredibly close to the sun. So we'll be studying the sun's corona by flying right through it. Um, so a couple of the technical features for us, we're always on a diet. Um, despite being on a Delta IV Heavy with an upper stage, uh, we still need to be incredibly light and compact. Uh, we need a huge launch lift um, as we, uh, as we leave, leave the, um, the planet. Um, so we'll be the most energetic launch. Um, uh, we, we weigh just 685 kilograms and that's fully fueled. We stand about three meters high. The uh, thermal protection system or the TPS or our heat shield is uh, about 2.3 meters in diameter. The spacecraft bus itself is very small. Um, it's only about a meter in diameter and about a meter and a half tall. I'll talk a little bit more um, about the thermal protection system in a minute. Um, and also our solar arrays. Uh, but we use um, uh, momentum wheels for attitude controls. So we minimize the amount that we have to fire our thrusters because I want my instruments to be measuring the solar wind, not the plasma cloud that, um, that was just created by our thrusters. And so we use our thrusters as, as infrequently as possible and rely as much as possible on our uh, wheels for attitude. A couple of photographs there just showing you um, the structure. Again, trying to get across just the size of it. It's pretty small. Um, and then you see a nice shot there of the propulsion tank in the center with just the harness around there. No other instrument boxes, no other subsystems in there. And you'll see just how small and how compact everything is. So here's a nice shot of our thermal protection system. Um, at closest approach, the front side of the heat shield will be at about 1400 degrees Celsius or 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. 
but the payload itself that sits in the shade on the main bus of the spacecraft, um, that's going to be at about a, a sort of a balmy room temperature, maybe about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees centigrade. Um, and so those instruments are working in a very, very normal environment. Uh, the heat shield itself is um, two phase sheets. They're made of carbon carbon um, with, so they're, they're very thin phase sheets. And then in the middle, there is um, a sort of a section of carbon carbon foam, which is about 97% air. Uh, so the whole thing is about four and a half inches thick. Um, so we lovingly refer to this as our eight foot Frisbee. Um, there is a white coating on the top. I'll show you a better picture of the white coating in a minute. Um, and that is a plasma sprayed alumina. Uh, that is a coating that was specially um, formulated for the solar probe. Um, and so it being, it's actually a sort of whiter than white coating. And so just like being in a, a white car on a hot day, you're far better off being in a white car than a black car. And so this white um, coating actually helps to reflect a lot of the sun's light and a lot of the heat away um, before it even has to get into the heat shield. Um, so I mentioned that the heat shield will, will be facing these temperatures, but of course I did already say that we're in a region of 3 million degree plasma. So you may wonder why we only have to, I can't say only because it's still really hot, but why we have to deal with a temperature of 1400 compared to this 3 million degrees. And of course, it's, it's because the corona itself is, is not very dense. And so if you imagine turning your oven on to 400 degrees, you can put your hand inside the oven and you won't get burned unless you actually touch a surface. And so in the same way that and unless you let that heat kind of couple into your fingers, if you stay in just the atmosphere in the oven, you'll be fine. Um, and so it's very similar. There aren't that many particles that are actually coupling into the heat shield. And so the amount of temperature, the amount of heat that gets coupled in is about um, 1400 degrees Celsius. Uh, you can see in the middle picture there, a nice shot of our titanium uh, assembly. This is our, our um, thermal protection. It's a, the structure that holds it uh, in place. Um, it also holds, houses our radiators that we use to cool the solar panels. And in the upper right hand picture there, you can see those black fin structures and they are the radiators uh, that we use to, to cool the, uh, the solar arrays. So talking of the solar arrays, here is a picture of sort of the, the very outside panel. So if you look at the picture in the center there, you can see this kind of one long piece and then there's this articulated piece that sticks out. Um, as we get close to the sun, I mentioned we pull those all the way down. They're on sort of like shoulder joints so that the solar panels themselves can kind of uh, flap and feather. And um, that allows us to maximize the amount of, of solar power we get when we're out around Venus and then tuck them in and minimize it as we come in around the sun. And so if you look at the picture on the left, the, the very top row of cells, which is the smallest row of cells, that is the only thing, it's like a knife edge, and they are the only cells that are illuminated as we get close to the sun. And we can create the same amount of power on that one row of cells as we, get, as we can on the entire solar wing um, out around Venus. I mentioned they are uh, cooled, they are actively cooled. We flow water through those solar panels. So they're rather like veins that flow through in between each of the solar cells. And uh, we, we cool them with liquid. It is water. Uh, people always um, expect it to be something more exotic. Uh, we've had every single review we've been to, somebody always says, hey, have you thought of using this fluid? And it always comes back, the water is the most effective coolant. And so that is how we cool the solar cells. We run the water through the panels and then it goes into an accumulator tank. The heat gets um, throw, uh, dispersed through those radiators that are on that truss structure, and then the water recir recirculates through the whole system. Uh, so this is a look at the spacecraft. This is the anti-ram side. Um, so if you think about when we're moving past, past the sun through the corona, we're kind of going sideways. And so this is the side that is, is um, kind of on the back side. 
Uh, so you'll see our thermal protection system out and proud at the front there, the most, certainly the most important thing on the spacecraft. Um, you also see a nice shot of the solar array wings there, the bit that looks silvery. So that's that panel that you just saw in the heliostat. We have a high gain antenna uh, that we use to communicate with the earth. Um, also, we, so we send commands up and we send our data back through there. There's a nice uh, also shot of the solar array cooling system um, that is dispersed around that, that uh, structure. And then if we look at the instruments, um, there is the, at the top there, the sweep SPC. I always think that as that of the, sorry, think of that as the bravest little instrument on the spacecraft because it kind of peeps around the heat shield and it, it gets no um, protection at all. It is out in the breeze. Um, also part of the sweep uh, suite of instruments is span B that you can see there. If I flip the spacecraft over, you'll see that um, span B has a sister instrument called span A plus. Those are looking primarily at the particles in the solar wind, the solar wind, the electrons, the alpha particles and the protons. Um, and it can also do some uh, composition measurements. Uh, the two instruments together, their fields of view fit together like the seams on a baseball. And that allows us to look at a 360 degree view of everything that is going on in the solar wind. Uh, above it, you see the ESA suite, epi low and epi high. And they are looking at those high energy particles that are associated with the transients. So with the shocks, with the flares, with the coronal mass ejections, um, anytime you see some transient feature, it is accelerating um, particles. So it's basically because it's moving so fast, it's slamming into the ambient solar wind. And just like you get um, a supersonic shock, that's exactly what we're seeing here. And it accelerates these very high energy particles. So we want to make sure we can measure that full suite not just the, the particles that make up the solar wind, but everything that is associated with the transients that go with it. Uh, you see uh, the field's magnetometers. So you saw the boom coming out in the animation I showed. We have three magnetometers that are on that boom, two flux gates and one search coil. The reason we have so many, we know that the field is gonna be very dynamic and it's gonna change a lot as we get close to the sun um, and then out further away. And so we want to make sure we have the full frequency coverage um, to be able to measure all of that magnetic field. And so we go from DC with the flux gates um, up to a few megahertz um, in the, using the um, uh, search coil. Uh, we have two flux gates. One is uh, positioned fairly close to the spacecraft. The other one is, is further down the boom. The reason we have the two is we use the inner one to kind of measure what's going on in the spacecraft. And then we can subtract that from uh, what the outer one is seeing and get much more precise measurements of the magnetic field. Uh, the field suite also has those antennas that you saw coming out in the animation. They are the electric field antennas. They measure obviously the electric fields, but also all of the plasma waves that we see um, in, the, in the solar wind. They'll allow us to measure the spacecraft potential um, and uh, they can find out a lot about what is going on in the, in the plasma itself. And then last but not least, the Whisper imager, that is a white light imager, and it's taking pictures basically of what we're about to plow through. Um, and so it's not looking traditionally as we would expect at the sun and taking solar images, but it's looking at the solar wind um, and the corona that the spacecraft is actually flying through. And so that is our instrument suite. Um, and then I'm just gonna show a nice animation, time-lapse, oh, sorry, nice time-lapse um, sequence of us building the spacecraft. Uh, so we start off by putting together the, um, the primary structure. And so you can see kind of just how small that main bus is. Here we are lowering in the harness and you see the propulsion tank there with the pink cover on it. Uh, again, noticing how small uh, everything is. There is the top deck, which, which has that cooling system and of course holds uh, our thermal protection system that's being lowered onto the spacecraft. And here we are installing the high gain antenna, allowing us to be able to communicate both send commands and get our data back. This is a magnetic swing test uh, where we literally swing the spacecraft and characterize all of the magnetic fields um, that we see on the spacecraft. Again, that is so we can subtract that from the measurements that the instruments are making and get a much more accurate magnetic field measurement. 
you notice the solar panels going on. And now here we are doing the, uh, putting together the heat shield. So you saw that bottom phase sheet and they're lowering on top of that, the foam structure and then bonding that together. They then flipped it over and put um, the phase sheet on the other side. Here we are lowering the, uh, the heat shield onto the spacecraft. We did a fit check um, at the Applied Physics Lab to make sure, and a, a sort of mass balance um, to make sure all the, the, you know, everything was fitting as we expected and the mass was, you know, there was no surprises on, on uh, it doing anything like talking the spacecraft or, or anything like that. So we, we did that in October. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, we took the spacecraft to um, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, which is just down the road from us at the Applied Physics Lab, uh, where we finished up the environmental testing. Uh, so we did um, the acoustic testing at Goddard, and then we also did all of our thermal balance and thermal cycling. So there's just some nice shots there of us lowering the spacecraft into uh, the uh, environment simulator. Um, you'll notice in the second picture, um, there is a structure hanging above the spacecraft. That's not actually our heat shield. That is a simulator for our heat shield. Uh, there's no chamber on earth where we could um, manage to put, uh, you know, shine a light and put 2,500 2, degrees on the front side of that eight foot um, structure. And so what we do is we put the heat shield through its own thermal um, environment testing. And what we have here is a simulator that basically puts the amount of energy that's coming out of the back side of the heat shield on orbit into uh, the, the spacecraft in the thermal vac chamber. Um, so that we were in there for about two months. Uh, we did full thermal cycling and thermal balance. And then we lifted the, uh, the spacecraft back out of the chamber and returned her to the clean room. Uh, just a week or so after that, we took her down to Florida. Uh, we transitioned, uh, we drove her to uh, Andrews Air Force Base where she went on a C-17. We had a beautiful smooth ride thanks to the US Air Force. Um, landed in Titusville in, uh, in Florida, took the spacecraft off um, the, uh, the, the plane and then took her to her new home. I just had to include that picture on the bottom right there because that just is my top gun picture of me getting off the plane. Um, all right, so that... Uh, Solar Probe then arrived at her temporary home later that evening at Astrotech, which is just outside the Kennedy Space Center. We unpacked her, unbagged her, and there she is in the clean room. Um, just a few final things left to do for us. Uh, we've installed the magnetometer boom. Uh, we will um, obviously install the solar panels. We have some final testing to do. Uh, we need to put the heat shield on, and then we'll put fuel in her, and she'll go into uh, the fairing. The heat shield has now arrived in Florida. Uh, I mentioned that the heat shield goes through its own thermal uh, test program. And so um, sh the heat shield came down just a few weeks after the, the main spacecraft. But you see um, in that sort of bottom center picture there, uh, there is the heat shield in uh, its shipping container, which ironically has a, a sign on it that does say, do not expose to direct sunlight. Um, and then so you see the, the heat shield in there, and uh, solar probe in the background there. Um, the final picture there, it's a little cheat. Uh, it doesn't actually look like that yet because we haven't put the heat shield on, but that is just a nice shot from when we had the heat shield installed at the Applied Physics Lab. You see that lovely white coating on the top there, that whiter than white coating. Uh, and here's a shot of our Delta IV Heavy. Um, here's the boosters that arrived. They came by boat uh, to Kennedy Space Center. Two came down on one boat and one came down on a, a second one. Um, and then we moved the boosters into the horizontal integration facility um, down on uh, 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 Canaveral Air Force Base. Um, and then uh, about two or three weeks ago, we rolled the rocket out to the pad and you can see it um, in the Delta IV facility there, basically just waiting for Solar Probe to turn up um, and then uh, we'll launch. Uh, so I just wanted to finish um, with going back to Gene Parker. I said that uh, he was, uh, our mission is named after him. And here he is um, 
at meeting meeting the spacecraft team and actually getting to see the spacecraft and and I did switch off the sound but uh, one of the things he comments on is just how happy everybody is um, in the in the clean room how happy everyone he's met is that is working on the mission and I think that is just a a, a, a good um, demonstration of just how much everybody that works on this mission truly 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 loves Parker Solar Probe. And so I'll finish with just letting you know how you can get social. Uh, you can follow us on the web, uh, parkersolarprobe.jhuapl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook, Parker Solar Probe, on Twitter, Parker Sun Probe. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm SolarGirl2018. I tweet about the mission all the time. And then I just wanted to finish up with mentioning that we had a um, a campaign where you could send your name to the sun. Unfortunately, the, the deadline was April 27th. So I hope that you all took advantage of that and submitted your name. We had over a million names um, put in. And so on Friday of this week, we are actually going to install the chip. Um, it's going in a commemorative plaque um, that uh, is dedicated to Gene Parker. Uh, the, uh, the chip itself also contains pictures of Gene throughout his career and of course the seminal paper from 1958 so I hope you were able to take advantage of that and so I will leave you uh, with the thought that it's been almost 60 years since a solar probe concept was introduced and I'm very happy to say that we are now on our way thank you all right. Well, thank you very much, Nikki. So we have uh, quite a few questions here, and I'm sure that some more will uh, show up. And so let's uh, let's see what we've got. So Cook asked, uh, has the reinforced carbon-carbon composite material been used on previous missions? Uh, it has not been used on previous missions. Um, it is, uh, it's very similar, however, to a graphite epoxy that you would find in your golf clubs or an expensive bicycle or tennis racket. Um, but we have not used it on a, on a space mission before. Um, we've used the kind of concept, I mean, it's a, it's a sandwich panel, and uh, we use sandwich panels on, on many things, in fact, or, or honeycomb panels. Uh, we have honeycomb panels in the main um, uh, body of the spacecraft. So the idea of the, the honeycomb panel has certainly been used before, but the particular carbon-carbon composite has not been used before. And as I mentioned, the coating itself, the alumina, is um, formulated... Uh, specifically for this mission. So this is a first. Okay, and staying with the uh, the heat shield here, Joe asks, is the heat shield large enough to completely mask the entire operating part of the satellite from the direct rays of the sun? Seems that some of the sun's direct rays would bypass the heat shield on your closest passes. Uh, no, it is actually big enough. Um, and we have a, a nine degree packaging umbra. Uh, so to make sure that um, we, we really don't, nothing will see. Uh, the, the heat shield has a, um, basically if you take it and you draw a cone right the way down, you will find that the magnetometer boom kind of comes right down at the apex of that cone. Um, and as I said, there's about an eight, eight, nine degree, I think it is a nine degree packaging umbra. Uh, so everything that you see behind the heat shield uh, is indeed behind the heat shield and in the shadow. The only things that stick out are those radio antennas, the, uh, the Faraday cup, and the knife edge of the solar panels. Everything else is, is in the shade. Okay, um, so you might want to uh, stop sharing so that, because uh, I know that you uh, yep. showed some, something with your, your arm there and people might not have seen it, so. All right, I will stop sharing. So Staying with uh, the temperature, John asks if the probe is only subjected to room temperatures because of the low density of the materials in the solar wind, what would happen if the PSP gets hit with a CME, which would potentially have a much greater density? Uh, would or could that be a showstopper? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, I often get the question, are you worried about seeing a CME? Um, and actually, no, we're designed to see a CME. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the maximum temperature really is when the plasma is at its densest, when we would see these big 
uh, transient events. Um, a normal operating temperature would be not, not up at that type of temperature. It is when we see um, the, the bigger events. And so it's, uh, we're confident that um, we'll, be, we'll be good. Um, I'm much more worried about not seeing a CME and the sun being dreadfully quiet. Um, as Vivian said, we haven't seen very many sunspots. I'd like a lot more sunspots and a lot more activity. I'm more worried about not seeing a CME when we're in close, actually. Okay, so uh, Jeffrey, uh, relating to that uh, close pass, Jeffrey asks, what is the typical duration of each close approach for each orbit? Are, you, are we talking hours, days? That's a great question. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, so our, our sort of average time that we're in very close is about 11 days. Um, so uh, we, we sort of think about our, our main uh, campaign being from about a quarter of an AU, so about like 53 solar radii away from the sun. And that's when we sort of start thinking of our closest approach. Um, but in close, um, in super, super close, it's a couple of hours. So when we talk about the, the it's about 3.7 million miles above the sun's surface that we are at that very final closest approach. That's about five hours on each orbit uh, that we're under um, 10 solar radii, but it's about 11 days that we're in, in very close. Okay, that's a long time to cook. Yes, it is. <laughs> Um, so speaking of Cook, uh, Cook asks another question here. Will the seven-year timeline extend into the next solar cycle, and will comparisons be made to cycle 24? I guess that uh, would mean how, how would this fit into the overall uh, program of understanding the, uh, the solar cycles? So as I mentioned, we're going to launch at the very end of 24, um, and then we will go seven years. So we'll be through the solar maximum of 25. Um, of course, we're a seven, we're design, you know, that's our, our sort of prime mission. Um, we do have um, fuel and uh, we, you know, that last orbit that we do is, is stable. Um, so we do these 24 petal orbits. When we do that final Venus um, flyby, we are actually finally then inside the orbit of Venus. And so we can't go any closer, but we can keep going in that final configuration as long as we have fuel to de-spin the momentum wheels. And so we're fairly confident that we'll go for 10 plus years. And so I actually hope, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an optimistic, sporty kind of girl. So I'm hoping that we will go beyond, um, I, I'd love to do the 11 years plus and do a full solar cycle and be able to do exactly what, um, what I think you said it was Cook that asked, um, can, we, can we then do comparisons to the previous solar cycle? So I have like fingers, toes and eyes crossed that we will make it um, long enough to be able to do exactly what you asked. But otherwise we'll see, we'll definitely see a good solar minimum and then up through solar maximum for sure. Okay, so both Chuck and uh, Jeffrey ask about uh, what's going to happen to the craft uh, after the mission is concluded. What, what are you going to do with it after the last planned orbit? Um, so we will keep going. So as I mentioned, that last orbit is stable. Um, and then it really just comes down to the amount of fuel that we had left. Uh, so you saw our propulsion tank. I mentioned that we use most, mostly wheels for attitude control, but every now and again, you do have to de-spin those wheels. And so we do have to fire thrusters um, at, uh, at certain points. So um, uh, basically what will happen is at the, it'll be a very sad day. We'll run out of fuel. Uh, we'll no longer be able to keep that heat shield oriented between us and the sun. The spacecraft will start to turn and the full sun will illuminate parts of the spacecraft that are not designed to see it. Um, at that point, it will break up into large chunks and then it will break up into smaller and smaller and smaller chunks until she becomes part of the corona and orbits the sun forever. Okay, well, that's, <laughs> that would be a good legacy. So that's, maybe there'll be, a little, there'll be that's a little chip out there. there. Yeah, there'll be a little chip out there with a million people's names Absolutely. orbiting the sun. Absolutely. So now, my heat shield engineer tells me the heat shield will never burn up and that will orbit forever. So okay. we'll see. <laughs> um, I just want to note here that, um, that um, if anyone, we would like to be able to capture everyone's questions in the Q&A. That will be actually saved at some point as well. And so if you've happened to uh, accidentally put one into the chat window, uh, we'd appreciate it if you would transfer it over to the Q&A window. Um, so let's see, Chuck asks, uh, what, what kind of cameras on the probe to send back 
pictures. I know you alluded to one that's going to kind of look where it's going to. So what, what's the nature of that camera? Uh, so that is, um, I'm not sure if you, uh, so I did show a little animation uh, that was in the sort of history bit with the Simpson committee, but you saw um, sort of like, uh, it looks like flowing light. I, I can't think of a better way to describe it, but that's the solar wind. And that's taken with the stereo camera. And this is um, very similar to those kind of images. Um, it is a specially built, designed to look at the solar wind. So um, it is really looking at, at the, all the stuff coming towards us from the sun. Um, and that is important because uh, we know signatures, you know, we, we know what a flux rope looks like. We know what a shock looks like. Um, it's going to be very hard to actually see that in the data. So I mentioned we're moving at 430,000 miles an hour. That is roughly half the speed of the solar wind. And so when we're going in, we're traveling, you know, we're sort of smashing into it and all of the features will be kind of compressed. And then as we're moving away from the sun, we're moving at the, you know, in the same direction as the solar wind. And so everything's going to kind of be smeared out. And so it's, it's really important for us to be able to see what we're plowing into to be able to sort of unlock um, those mysteries, you know, to be able to really put into context what our in situ data are doing. And so it's not there to take pictures of the sun. There are many other um, uh, assets that can do that for us. Uh, Solar Orbiter, for example, is, a, is our sister mission uh, that is being done by NASA and ESA. Um, and that has a full range of remote sensing instruments on it. That is going out of the ecliptic, and so that'll be looking down, seeing some of the sun's pole, but importantly for us, it'll be able to image where we are flying past at the time. And also, of course, the ground-based telescopes here on Earth that will be on um, when we are close to the, the sun. So um, we, we mostly look at the, um, the images of, of the solar wind that are gonna help us to be able to determine what we're seeing in our data. Okay, and, and kind of going along with that, that's interesting about how when you're moving there, you're gonna have a really large, um, uh, well, I guess, increased uh, particle you know, density. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you and so Jeffrey asks, how are and, th and this is kind of related? Um, how are the electronics hardened against radiation? Because you're going to have a lot of particles there, and and maybe some other radiation, and so the flux of that is going to be much greater than normal. So, what have you done? Anything special? So um, we have. I mean, we've we've certainly done the sh done shielding on our electronics. Um, I mean, you know, most of it's inside the bus. There's very little electronics that are outside. So most of them are are um, very well. Uh, protected inside the the main body of the spacecraft. Um, anything that's outside, of course, is radiation shielded. Um, to be honest, we did radiation belt storm probes. Uh, was the last image that uh, last um, mission that we did at the Applied Physics Lab, and that was a real problem for radiation. So um, we kind of took everything that we learned from doing that mission and uh, applied it. Um, we have to be careful because I mentioned mass is a big deal for us. Um, so, you know, sometimes you can just put a ton of shielding on and you just put more and more aluminum on until it's, it's fully shielded. We had to be a lot more smart with the way we did that because we couldn't have it, you know, weighing a ton. Um, and so uh, we, we shield what needs to be shielded, but most of it is very well protected inside the spacecraft bus itself. Okay. And this is um, sort of almost related to, to that. And so I know that uh, a lot of spacecraft end up being, uh, when you go back on the backside of the sun, you're out of uh, contact on uh, the Mars rovers. When, yeah. the, um, when Mars is on the wrong, we're, we're out of communication. And so Ray asked during orbits, are there periods of radio blacks, blackouts? And if so, how long will these be? Yes, it's, it's, um, it's terror. Uh, we, we joke about, you know, that I know JPL had the seven minutes of terror with, uh, with um, uh, the, when they landed the, the rover. We have about 40 days of terror. Um, there are periods, wow. um, just as you say, that uh, just orbital dynamics and where the spacecraft and the Earth are, um, that we are out of contact for uh, 30 to 40 days um, on certain orbits. Not, not every orbit, but um, there are periods where it is that bad. Um, and so uh, one of the things I didn't mention is that Solar Probe is probably the most um, sophisticated uh, spacecraft in terms of autonomy and fault management. Um, 
you know, even, even when we can see the spacecraft, it takes seven minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. And so there's no way we can kind of joystick um, the, uh, the, the, the probe at all. Um, it, it, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do. Uh, so, you know, we just have to um, let it go and, uh, and, and hope for the best. So we've coded everything into this spacecraft. Uh, there are little sensors all over the body that um, are not supposed to see the sun. If any of them see the sun, they immediately trigger a whole bunch of rules that get executed um, on the spacecraft to actually look after itself. And so during those 30, 40 days, uh, we have to, um, to, to hope that she looks after herself. Well, it's too bad you couldn't have uh, pre-planned and had a couple of probes out there at, at uh, you know, different points, as, you know, maybe a couple of Lagrange points or something like that that would have, uh, you know, had access to direct line with the spacecraft. We'll um, do that with the probe too. <laughs> okay. Well, we've got time for just a couple more questions here. We'll try not to go too late. And so William asks, uh, is there any ability to store data during opposition? So what kind of data? Uh, is it still going to be accumulating data even when it's out of, uh, out of radio contact? Yes, uh, we actually have planned for um, all of this, this uh, uh, sort of blackout in communications, if you like. Uh, so we have a solid state recorder um, on the spacecraft um, and actually many of the instruments have their own uh, recorders as well as, as backup. Um, and so yes, we can store uh, the, at least two orbits worth of data. Um, and so we have a, a plan for how we store and then dump uh, the data. So we, we, uh, we don't intend to lose a bit of this precious data. Um, so yes, we, we take data all the time and then downlink it as soon as we see the earth. Basically, as soon as we close the link, we downlink the data. Okay. And then uh, Joe asked this related to data. Do you plan on collecting anything when you go by Venus? Um, so no, um, at least not for the first couple. Um, we, uh, we actually have well, the very first one we're still commissioning, so we wouldn't be collecting then. Um, but uh, so in the same way that whenever we see the spacecraft, we downlink data, six of the seven um, Venus flybys are in our prime science downlinking time. So we would be downlinking data and sending it uh, to the Earth. When we downlink, we switch off all the instruments and all the power goes into that high speed downlink. Um, there is one Venus flyby right now that we do not have to switch off the instruments. And so I would say, yes, we could be taking data during that time. Um, not totally clear what, what data we take because of course we're not designed to look at Venus. We're designed to study the sun. So we're, we're very specialized in, um, in what the, you know, what the instrument energy ranges, et cetera, are. But I think we could do some interesting stuff with the radio waves, particularly looking for lightning and other signatures around Venus. So I'm hopeful that we will, in the later flybys, um, be able to switch on a couple of instruments and take data, but we're not, we're not planning at this point to do it. I just have fingers crossed that we'll be able to. Okay. And we're gonna make this one the, the last question. So Andy asks, are there plans to make another probe in the future that could be, <coughs> excuse me, solar powered instead of one dependent on the fuel source? And uh, I'm guessing if, uh, you know, if you had something that was solar powered rather than the, you know, reaction engines that you probably have on the spacecraft. So we are solar powered. Uh, we're, we're fully solar powered. That's why we have those big solar wings. Uh, the only reason we carry the fuel uh, that you see in the propulsion tank is actually to de-spin the momentum wheels and to, um, to do very small puffs, um, maybe like trajectory correction maneuvers after we've done a Venus flyby. And so that's why this, the fuel tank is so small. Um, we don't need a lot of it. Uh, a, a little puff from a thruster in space is, is worth an awful lot. So we have very small uh, thrusters, um, but we are totally solar powered. And actually that was, that was one of the big breakthroughs um, that we had that enabled this mission. Um, all the previous incarnations of a solar probe have used RTGs. Um, and have in fact flown out to Jupiter and done flybys and taken many, many years to, to do a flyby of the sun. And um, uh, NASA gave the Applied Physics Lab a challenge to, to actually do a mission that did not require an RTG and did it on solar power. And so we stay in the ecliptic plane 
Uh, that's why we do so many orbits so that we can accumulate enough uh, flyby through through the corona to be able to answer these questions. But yes, we are solar powered um, and uh, we're very happy. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nikki. This was fantastic. I learned a, a tremendous amount, and I think that we had some pretty high quality questions here. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have some, you know, knowledgeable and very, you know, intrigued people with this mission. I'm, um, I'm delighted that this is, uh, um, you know, going to be going. So yes, we're very excited. So July thirty first, four fourteen a.m. Um, it'll be it'll be in the night sky. All right. So do they get it? Do you get a show? Um, no, I guess it wouldn't. Uh, I know when they launch from Vandenberg, everyone gets these tremendous uh, shows of the rockets go up, but I guess they go out over the Atlantic, and so you miss those down in. Uh, yes, you have to be. You have to be down. Um, uh, come to Florida, you'll be able to see it from uh, anywhere anywhere near Cocoa Beach. Um, will be okay. a great view. Delta Four heavy, so okay. I'll be able to see it for miles. Well, that's a good vacation. So yes, good. yes. All right. Well, that's all for tonight, everyone. You can find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We will post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel in the next few days. So thank you very much, everyone.